Hello everyone, my new workspace is finished! But the acoustics are not that great as you can hear. So that's something I need to work on later. Also, I still need to make new windows and doors and the walls need to be insulated. But that's something for later. I also need to dig out the basement which will probably be the subject of the next video. It took me over a year to build this new workspace and restructure the rest of the garden. So unfortunately I didn't have time to make normal videos and I was only able to upload shorts. But that's all over now and I'm finally able to make videos again. So in this video I'd like to show you my homemade heat pump. Ok so I made this heat pump from an old AC unit and the only parts I used are the compressor and the capillary tube. This AC unit was originally filled with R22, which is very damaging to the ozone layer, so I didn't want it to go into the atmosphere. And please people, never ever just blow refrigerant into the atmosphere, because it's very damaging for the environment. So evacuating refrigerant without a license is illegal, so if you want to see how the refrigerant was removed, I advise you to become a Patreon, because I will soon upload a video of that evacuation. Daniel Crusoway from the YouTube channel Improvatech is currently my only Patreon. So thank you very much Daniel for your support and I hope you and my new Patreons will enjoy that video. Well that being said, this is what the heat pump looks like and I will first show you all the important parts. So we start with a 1000 watt compressor, a high pressure gauge with a protection valve to protect it when I'm vacuuming down the system. I vacuum the system down through this port, so I can hook up the vacuum pump or I can release gas from this part, but I will explain that later. Two heat exchangers, this is the hot side. A filter dryer to remove particles and moisture from the refrigerant. A capillary tube. An insulated temperature sensor that senses the vapor temperature. Again two heat exchangers, this is the cold side. And in here is another insulated temperature sensor that senses the superheat. Two pressure gauges, one vacuum, one to 16 bar. And you have these combined, but they didn't come in in time, so I resolved it like this. And these valves are to protect the gauges from vacuum or overpressure, because they can't handle that. And with these three-way valves, I can choose through which heat exchanger I will let the refrigerant flow. And I have here two water pumps to circulate water through the heat exchangers. And I only use the, the ones on this side at the moment. So the middle ones I don't use at the moment. I have one temperature sensor for the dry bulb temperature and one temperature sensor for the wet bulb temperature. So I will now explain to you how it works. So the compressor pumps the refrigerant for which I use propane through this pipe to one of these condensers. They both do the same thing, the only difference is that in this heat exchanger the heat is removed by antifreeze and in this one by groundwater. When the gas is compressed in the condenser the temperature rises and because the heat is being removed in the heat exchanger the gas turns into a liquid. The liquid propane is then pushed through the filter dryer and through the capillary tube. This capillary tube creates a resistance which in turn creates a pressure difference. So the pressure is high on this side and low on this side. So when the liquid propane comes out of the capillary tube, it enters the low pressure side. And it has room to expand, but it needs heat to do that. So at this point the propane is 80% liquid and 20% gas. And it removes heat from the water or antifreeze that flows through one of these heat exchangers, which act as evaporators. And again, this heat exchanger is for antifreeze and this one for groundwater. So when it absorbs heat, it expands without rising in temperature. But at some point, most of the liquid has turned into a gas, which is then still very cold, and it will start to rise in temperature. The amount the temperature rises is called superheat. And with the superheat temperature, you can determine if the right amount of refrigerant is present in the system. So the superheat is the difference between the vapor temperature and the temperature of the gas when it exits the evaporator. 
When that temperature difference is too low, it means that there's too much refrigerant in the system for the amount of heat supplied to the evaporator. This can be a problem when condensed refrigerant enters the compressor. Because it's unable to pump liquid, it can get damaged. When the temperature difference is too high, it means that the amount of refrigerant in the system is too low. So all of the refrigerant turned into a gas too soon and therefore the temperature could rise more than it should. This is not a problem for the system, but the efficiency will not be great. To determine the right superheat, I use this app. You just enter the temperature that is supplied to the evaporator, which is called the wet bulb temperature, and the temperature that is being supplied to the condenser here, which is called the dry bulb temperature. You can select Celsius here, of course, or for those who are stuck with the inferior measurement system, you can choose Fahrenheit and then it gives you the superheat value. The dry bulb temperature is just the temperature that is supplied to the condenser, and the wet bulb temperature is normally used in an air supplied evaporator. To make a wet bulb temperature reading, you put a wet cloth around the thermometer and hang it in front of the air inlet. So in dry air, the water in the cloth will evaporate, which lowers the temperature of the thermometer. In very humid air, the moisture in the cloth won't evaporate, so the temperature doesn't drop. This measuring method is to compensate for the thermal energy that is present in the moisture in the air, which therefore influences the heat load on the evaporator. All this information I found on the website of AC Service Tech, who also has a YouTube channel with some very good videos about this subject. There is a link in the description to both the website and the YouTube channel. Well, in this case, I don't have to put a cloth around the thermometer because the thermometer is already quite wet. And because there is no moisture in the air situation here, I can just use the actual water temperature. So after the refrigerant comes out of the evaporator in its gaseous state, it will be sucked into the compressor and the cycle starts all over again. And of course, this is a continuous cycle, so everything I described happens at the same time in the whole system. Ok, so to fill it with refrigerant, I first vacuum down the system to remove all the air and moisture. Then I leave it under vacuum with the pump off to see if there aren't any leaks. Then I attach these hoses to the low and the high pressure side of the compressor and before putting on the hose, I flush it with some propane to make sure all the air is out. Then I can just fill it to atmospheric pressure. Then I turn on the compressor and with the superheat value I can determine if I need to supply more gas to the suction side or pump some gas back into the cylinder via the valve on the high pressure side. Now when I tested the system it turned out that it pumps heat so fast from one reservoir to the other that I can't determine the right amount of refrigerant. So when the heat pump is installed so I can heat and cool my house I can determine the right amount of refrigerant, because then the temperature will be stable. A good functioning heat pump can have a coefficient of performance of around 4, which means that with this 1 kW compressor, we could theoretically pump 4 kW of heat. But we will see what the performance is when it's all operational. In the near future I'm going to implement a thermal expansion valve to make it more efficient, but because this is the first heat pump I have ever built, I wanted to keep it simple. Also, the compressor can get quite hot, so I'm also going to install a cooling system on it, which has the benefit that the heat from the compressor will also be taken to the hot output side of the heat pump, which adds to the total heat output of the heat pump. So this heat pump does not invert its refrigerant cycle, but instead I can just change where each individual heat exchanger is hooked up to. So for example, during summer it will supply cold water to a heat exchanger in my house and the heat removed from my house will be pumped into my hot tub, a boiler to heat up shower water or as a last resort dump it into the ground via groundwater. And in the winter it can extract heat out of groundwater and supply that heat to my central heating system. Also, when I heat up my hot tub with wood, I could just let it cool down over the coming week, or I can supply that heat to my heat pump and use it to heat my house. Efficient, right? For safety reasons, because I use propane, the heat pump will be installed in my workspace. And all the pipes to connect everything together can be put into these big pipes that I've installed in my garden. These connect the house with the workspace and the hot tub. I want to heat my house with 35 degrees Celsius water to increase the efficiency of the heat pump, 
And to do that, I implemented these blowers into my convection pits. With my current gas powered heating that already works well, so it also must work with the heat pump. These blowers are turned on when the hot water is supplied to the convection pits. Okay, that's it for now. Please go check out the R22 evacuation video I have on Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching and see you next time. Thank you.